I work at MIT with uh, Tim Berners-Lee on a couple of interesting things um, that I will talk to you in detail tomorrow, actually. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about now is um, this new concept that we like to call uh, small data. It's basically just data um, about yourself. It's what your content is on the web. And the problem we have right now with, for instance, the um, Internet of Things or the Web of Things uh, that is going to hit us really hard in the next few years where we're going to find ourselves um, like completely overwhelmed with a lot of data, especially health data. And we really want to control this data because we'll see how um, companies through really powerful um, algorithms will decide basically our fate. Like, are we going to get a loan? Are we going to get a proper education? Are we going to get um, healthcare? What kind of healthcare based on our like day-to-day -day activities that get logged? So the point is that we want to make sure these data stays our, under our control. And um, I guess tomorrow you're going to hear a lot more about this uh, in terms of how the technology actually works. And um, also, I think we can probably help a few of the people that were here before with, um, with um, I don't know, things like business models, uh, like for the decentralized uh, web uh, applications, um, governance, and a bunch of other stuff, I guess. Hey, that's super quick. Uh, and with three minutes and 18 seconds to go. <laughs> it's excellent, excellent. Um, so next is Nick Thomas around. Let's talk about running your own email. Nick, come up, come and hang out. Um, <coughs> there we go. We've got five minutes starting to start talking. I uh, was kind of expecting not to do it this morning. I thought we'd do it later. But uh, there we go. Anyway. Uh, it's just five minutes anyway. Yes, because yeah. it'd be over in the flash. <laughs> One thing I do is just spend the time talking about how I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while the wonderful talks about what else is going on is happening, I was preparing to do a short talk with slides. Uh, and in that time, I set up an email server and an XMPP instant messaging server. Um, to play with them. It, it took about 25 minutes to do. But what I noticed on the decentralized.org website, there's this wonderful poll saying, what do you want to decentralize? And the top answer was email. But 30 people said, I, don't, I can't decentralize my email right now. And this confuses me because I've been running my own email for 10 years and it's gotten easier. It's gotten a lot easier since uh, 19, 2005. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what people are having trouble with. That's pretty much it. Uh, I work for a hosting company, so we have a great interest in people running their own stuff on <laughs> our servers, but also their own servers. Uh, they can do that as well. We have a open source project called Symbiosis, which sets up the email server for you, does everything for you. You install it, you tell it what your domain name is, it uploads the DNS. It does all the hard stuff for you, you give it an SSL certificate, and then you have email working and you can email anyone in the planet, you can send instant messages to anybody else on the planet who's using XMPP, which used to include Google Talk, and mine still. They, they keep turning it off and turning it on again. That's pretty much all I've got to say because I can't show you the shiny interface and things that you can use with these things. So if you're having trouble hosting your email, come and chat and we can work out why it's difficult because I don't want it to be difficult. I think anyone here should be able to do it. What's your web address? My web address? Well, for uh, this solution. Uh, Symbiosis.bynhart.co.uk is uh, a website for documentation on Symbiosis? Yeah, and yeah. are you going to come to the speed geeking session and show people the Chinese face? Maybe that would be a good place to, to show you. Uh, I, yes, I yeah. won't see dating, you can see speed geeking, maybe. It's much less scary. Um, okay, thank you very much. So next up we have uh, Matrix.org, run your own IP, IM or web concert. Hello. Hey. Back again. Yeah. Back again. Yes. So yes, I'm Olvar and uh, I guess I'll just talk a bit more about what Matrix is. Um, 
So yeah, we're uh, a non-profit open source organization uh, called matrix.org and we've uh, written this protocol that everyone can use. But I guess the, the problem we're trying to tackle here is, um, you know, all of you, most of you probably talk, uh, you know, IM communications or online chat like IRC. You might be using stuff like uh, uh, voice and video calling like Skype or Hangouts or uh, iMessage or whatever it is. And the problem here is all that data is, you know, it's uh, all your text data and uh, uh, videos and everything is stored in silos that belong to you know, Facebook or Google or Apple or whatever it is. And it's of course in their interest to keep that data because you know they want to process it, they want to make money of it. And we want to give, uh, you know, taking back the net is exactly what we want to do. We want to take that data, bring it back to you because it belongs to you. It doesn't belong to any corporation. Um, so to, to the sense that we want anyone to own that data. So for example, with, if you want to use Matrix, you can use uh, you can run your own server. You can literally have your own data and control it. And um, you cannot you only need to send that data to the people you're talking to. So if say we three are in a conversation, we will share that data, but no one else will get that data. Um, and uh, uh, you can also encrypt the data. So you basically uh, you can have your own data and make sure it's it's secure. Um, and I think the problem we have with that kind of um, uh, decentralized communication is that we need to get people who aren't techies, who aren't aware of what it means to, uh, to have your data siloed into different uh, boxes. Um, they need to be aware of it. So, you know, my mum, my sister, they need to be, to, to be telling, um, you know, the Facebooks and Apples and say, actually, I want to be able to talk to other people. I don't want you to just keep your data and not interoperate. And I think that's the real, the real challenge we have here. Because yes, as as when I talk to techies and I talk to people who care about uh, decentralizing, they, they get it and they understand and they say yes, we need a way to interoperate. We need to, a way to own our own data and be able to move from one provider to another without having a massive have to, to to move your data and to access your data. But until we get you know the common man to 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 rise up and say actually I want to be able to talk to anyone regardless of how, which app they choose to use, then we won't get it because it is not in a corporation's interest to share data or to interoperate. So we had, uh, the previous guy mentioned XMVP, we have written a bridge from uh, Matrix to XMVP, we want to we have a bridge from Matrix to IRC, we have a bridge to Slack, we have a bridge to uh, Skype and <coughs> Jabber. Basically, you know, honestly I don't really care, you know, which system you want to use, whether that be Matrix or XMVP or something like it. I just want the um, communication to be decentralized and open and free for everyone. And I think at some point something will succeed. I think it'll just take time. Um, hopefully it could be Matrix, but it could be something else. But the point is we want to give back the power of um, the data back to the users and um, just keep it completely open, just like email. I mean. If I want to send you an email, I don't need to worry, are you on Gmail, are you on Yahoo? I just send you the email and you can read it wherever you want. Kristen? Yeah, I was just wondering, who is using it? And like, have you guys launched? Like, what are you doing to get adoption? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. Yeah, So, we are, we've been uh, uh, at it for about a year and it is really um, ready for production. People are using it in, in real life, you can actually uh, run the uh, open source software and it will it will actually work. You can run it as it is or you can, like I say, we have bridges to other systems so that you know if you're particularly tied to RC like I am, um, you can still connect to RC and, and uh, keep your existing structure that way. Um, we have several companies who are interested in using it but I mean from our point of view it's more the sort of open source community, the, the people who actually care about pr uh, privacy who are using it and, and writing their own gateways. So we have um, you know, people writing their own clients or taking our client and, and modifying it, putting, putting it into um, the website because we use uh, WebRTC for the VoIP. So it's all, uh, you know, if you have one, uh, one WebRTC client and another, they can talk to each other. Any other questions? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the company name? Or the uh, so it's matrix.org. Um, so it's a non-profit organization and Matrix is just a protocol. But we also have free and open source um, clients and service that you can literally just clone and run and they should work and you become part of the system. 
Or, you know, you can take the spec and write your own. And that's perfectly fine. Let's give a round of applause for first man to make the spec. Next up, CC Light, a non blockchain community currency. Hey, there we go. Um, first of all, apologies because I've signed up for about two of these, so you're going to see me again. Um, so, CC Light, since about 2005, um, it's community currency software written in Perl. Um, it's not blockchain, um, but funnily enough, in 2005, I did use cross hashing to actually authenticate the transaction, so it sort of anticipated it a bit. It's multi-currency because um, I talked to Michael Linton, who invented Let's, which is the sort of most modern um, mutual social credit. Um, it's probably about the only one that's multi-currency, although I think Cyclos may be now. Sorry, I had to do some notes. Um, there are templates in about 10 languages, I think, now, though I use Google Translate for a lot of languages. My ex helped me with the Chinese, so the Chinese is okay. Um, there's an app for it now. Um, it's CC Lite on SourceForge and GitHub. Um, the take up in the last few years because of blockchain has not been great, but it's never really died. And I know there's about 10 groups that are using it, so I'm just going to let it go on. Um, it could always be with some help, especially with translations. So I think that's really about it. Um, you know, it's a little thing that's made, making its way and has made its way for about 10 years. And thank you. And any questions? I think I've still got some time. Yeah, plenty of time. Questions? CC Light. No questions? Oh, yeah, one yes. back. Um, if it's not blockchain based, what's the basis of trust and how does it work? Um, no, nothing really. It's um, <laughs> it's it's ba it's, ba it's basically central server, login, passwords, etc. It's old school. If, if you if you like, you can trust the transactions because, as I say, there's a there's a cross hashing between the two things that means that trans you know that the plus side and the minus side are connected to each other. Please. Um, yes, uh, as I say, CC Lite on SourceForge, so it's SourceForge, CC Lite, GitHub, H. Barnard, CC Lite, um, and somewhere on my rather bordelic website, there's CC Lite, there's a page for it. One of these days I will make a whole... <laughs> it's just literally the letter C, C, and then the word Lite. Lite, L-I-T-E, yeah. Any more? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, next, uh, next one, is it you again? Is it uh, Vectomar? Yeah. Sorry, sorry about this. I thought we'd be separated. Um, and this is, this is entirely a thought experiment, although it does contain a few lines of very dreadful code. Um, I thought in about, I think about 1995, well, there's packet switching for packets. So why isn't the packet switching for packets? You know, i.e. physical packet switching. Um, the first thing that people do switch is actually people, in that there's lift share, etc., etc., there's lift, etc., etc., etc. But I felt there's all these things going up and down the country, from country to country, all those things have spare capacity. So therefore, as this thought experiment and the two or three lines of dreadful software, we will build a thing to actually consolidate and use that spare capacity. In other words, if your aunt is going to Glasgow, then you can put a packet, which we hope will not explode, in her car to someone else that, you know, needs the packet in Glasgow. And, you know, on a more serious note, we put that in white, white van man's van, and that goes. And the second layer of this, which is actually more difficult computationally, <coughs> is that if someone goes to Glasgow, then there are segments of that journey which are also useful. In other words, London to Glasgow is a thing, but that could include London to Birmingham, London to Liverpool, if the person wanders up the country, you know, as Broadway wanders through New York, you know, going hither and thither. So, therefore, London to Birmingham could contain a packet, etc., etc., etc. 
Um, I did start on this a couple of times, and the last, um, the last piece of that is a thing called Neo4j, which I think some people know, which is basically a graph database, because, as Blaise Pascal said, that seems to be the most convenient representation of this. So, there we are. That is also, the dreadful bit is also on SourceForge, it's called Vectormar. Um, I think it may be on GitHub as well, but it could do with some help, and I'd be glad if anyone would come and talk to me about this, because I don't, I don't think it's a stupid idea. Um, it is a bit stupid, but hey, <laughs> it's fun. Thank you, thanks for that, and I'm through. Any questions about physical matters? I was going to say, let's do a session on this tomorrow, I'm working on something. Soon. Oh, okay, great, great, yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, next up, we have uh, Tristan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tristan Nito. Uh, I come from France, so if you, if you wonder about the uh, slight accent, you know where it comes from. Um, I work for a company uh, called Cozy Cloud, that's C-O-Z-Y, and then a cloud. Um, I used to work for Mozilla for 17 years, uh, but I think the next, next challenge now is, is about decentralization of the internet. And so, well, the question is, what could I do for that? And so I joined Cozy Cloud. Cozy Cloud is a personal cloud solution. It is a platform that you can host on a Raspberry Pi 2, um, or you can host on a a hosting service on a, on a, on a VPS, and then it, it runs your, the application that you give it to. Uh, it's open source, you, there, it's shipping with um, a webmail client, uh, a calendar client, you can synchronize uh, files, uh, there are a bunch of other things. You can uh, get your banking data from your, the various banks and host it on your personal server, and then and it's open. We want more application for that. Um, it's written in Node.js, uh, it uses uh, CouchDB, so it's pretty modern technology. Uh, it's not PHP or whatever. Uh, um, so it's, uh, the idea is to put it in the hands of millions of people, and we need developers, and we also need people that be part of the community to come and help us in achieving uh, this. I, I would have loved to demo this to you because it's you know, it makes a lot more sense when you see the product. It's two and a half years old. Uh, we're really close to uh, shipping a, uh, a version with a commercial partner, um, you know, with, with marketing and stuff. Uh, the idea is that it has to be uh, decentralized, it has to be open source, it has to run on your own uh, hardware, it has to be compatible with uh, standards. We're working on standards for uh, secure sharing amongst different uh, services. And of course, it has to be a, a, a pleasure and a delight uh, to use. Because if we want mass adoption, if we really want to challenge the Google and Facebooks of the world, we need to make a product that is really, really nice to use. And so we're focusing really hard on that. Um, and finally, we want to bring added value uh, to the user so that it's not just uh, you know something clunky, clunky uh, and, and hard to manage that does almost as well as Facebook and Google. We want to do something else and we want to empower people with their own data uh, and with quantified self and with the Internet of Things. We know there is a lot more data that is going to be uh, produced by the user and on which the user needs to have a lot of control as opposed to using software as a service where they, get, they give away all their data in exchange of a cheap service. So this is what we want to achieve. Um, well, look at me and come and find me uh, if if you want to help and or just chat. A question there. Got a question. Um, one of the problems I've got with things like this is running them at home, which is what would be the ideal situation. Is that um, all the ISP companies have lots and lots of firewalling, so it's fine if we host this as a hosting company. But my dad isn't going to do that. So he's going to do it on his own machine and plan or home. That. That's a very good question, and so uh, th this is this is open source. It could be downloaded for from GitHub. So if you want to host it at home, you can do that. You know, as a nerd, that's fine. I love you for doing it, uh, but it's not for everybody. Uh, and this is why we want to do the, the <coughs> offer the same piece of software that is going to run and be managed by someone you pay hard cash for that, and that would be a hosting company. 
um, and for a couple uh, of uh, bucks, pounds, euros per year, per month, you could you could rent probably like two, three, four pounds a month. You could have that service. You pay someone that is going to give you the electricity, uh, give you the internet access, uh, rent you the hardware, and, and manage the thing for you, and so you never have to uh, uh, fiddle with the command line, and it's you know it's going to just work. So th these are this is the solution we found. Uh, we hope there will be a better solution, but we have two solutions, which is either you manage it at home and you pay for uh, the power and the internet access and the hardware, or you rent it uh, from a, a professional company that is going to be doing that for you. This is the way we see in order to reach uh, millions, potentially, of users, which is what we want to do. Wow. Did I say something wrong? 12 uh, seconds of question answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no question. Uh, could you run it on the Xbox rather than a Raspberry Pi? Because everyone has Xboxes and very few have a Raspberry Pi. Excellent, yes, no uh, I don't have any answer. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's it's, it's just that. Great. You know where to find me. I will be around for the jobs and all. Are you having a session? Because there seems to be. I, I'd love to, but I was late. Uh, in, uh, I can I propose a session right. tomorrow. I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, so, um, we, are, we are very close to the end. So, We've got more lightning talks than we have time in this session. What we're going to do is we're going to have some more lightning talks tomorrow. If you're still on the queue now, you're at the top of the queue tomorrow. We're going to do one more. There's going to be Blaine Cook. And then we are going to... So this, the schedule for the rest of the conference is being kind of scribbled up out there as you go through with the coffee. We're going to have this one talk and you're going to go and get a coffee, figure out where you want to go next. And over to Mr. Blaine Cook. Sorry. One question to me. My lightning talk is very much related to what he said about Coast and Tell because we have a similar project. So, I may I wait for 12 minutes? So, <laughs> wait, wait. No, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, our project is Calfly, and we have you have the two solutions that you say. We uh, we are determined to find a third solution. So uh, what we will do for, we also have one something that people can host at home, how people can, can host their mail server and everything at home. Uh, we think it has to be a very easy process. People have to, to uh, be able to do that. So we will use um, PageKai to make it uh, available from everywhere. So basically our process is that you select your domain, you get shipped the device, and then it will be available for you. We have we will have uh, full disk encryption on the device, so there is will be a key, a USB key you need to boot it up. When you plug this out, nobody can uh, use your device even if he uh, steals it. We will also ship with email and calendar and the necessities of a modern cloud solution. And if you want to, to talk about it, we will try. Our, our goal is to try to bring together all the awesome open source projects and make it e really easy for people to host it at home. Okay, thank so, you. What's the name? Kelsey. 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 Okay, uh, sorry I missed the call earlier. I was <coughs> helping prep coffee, so, uh, and I'm now the only person standing between you and coffee uh, and tea. Um, so, I just wanted to do a little bit of uh, tone setting. I think uh, you know we're all technologists here. We all like the tech uh, and everything. But I think you know I've, I've been doing this. I think like many people here, uh, this decentralization thing for a long time. And I mean, to be honest, it feels like we're further away uh, in in many regards than we were ten years ago. Because ten years ago we had XMPP and Jabber and email services that weren't mostly Gmail. Um, so I just want to. Uh, I'll, I'll invoke Ben Verdmiller, uh, who has been a member of the indie web community for a long time, and, and is sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a shame he couldn't be here today because he's, he's worked on these things for a long time as well. Um, and he had a series of, of tweets that he labeled as satire, but I, I, I don't think they are. Um, so he says, signed feeds, pub sub, a simple verb protocol, a publisher, and a reader. Boom, decentralized web. I'll let you argue about the specifics. I, I reckon he missed identity, but you know. Uh, scene, 100 years into the future, an apocalyptic wasteland, shouts on the radioactive winds, Jason LD, 
<laughs> micro formats. One man surviving the apocalypse in his radiation proof exoskeleton, simply yelling, RSS, 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 <laughs> over and over again. In the distance, App City, with its gleaming towers and shine to shiny toothed people, the citizens are happy there, but, they do, but do they remember freedom? The masters of App City carefully <coughs> sniff and prune the culture. Subversive elements are removed as if they never existed. Who would see? On one side, coders fighting the user, hands bloodied and dirty. On the other, wealth, but under the yoke of control. What a choice. Back in the present. I don't know where I'm going with this. One man types grimly into his iPhone, and I'm late for a baby shower. Um, <laughs> so I just I, I want you to remember that that we're not we're not fighting against um, you know the the against each other and against technical specifications. We're we're trying to give people choice and trying to give people actually good ways to interact with one another. Um, so. Uh, I guess one last little anecdote. I was at uh, a workshop in, in Boston at MIT, um, would have been six years ago, before the cookie law. And there were a bunch of people in a room talking about how we needed to ensure that users had control over their privacy and how they could control whether or not cookies were installed in their browsers. And I was just like, what, what are you talking about? And, and, and tried, implored that, you know, like, cookies are the thing that let me share content with other people. They identify me on the web and they enable me to, to sort of share content between people. If you take away that ability, then you're taking away my, my, you know, my uh, agency on the web. The threat model for me as a user is forgetting and losing touch with my friends, not the government. Uh, so remember that when, when we're talking about all of these sorts of things. You know, the government and control is important and we need to, we need to consider that. But really, this is for the users. It's not, and, and for us, and for our communities. So, guys, going to get coffee. Next session in 10 minutes. We're going to start doing stuff. Uh, one other thing we've got, I have these really centralized tickets if anyone wants them. So, if you're going to use it, then come and get them. Enjoy, guys. So, my name is Ava Pascal. Uh, I work uh, on Digital Bill of Rights, which I just wanted to explain to you where it came about, why it came about, and what can we do to take it further. And also, we're looking for people to get involved in streamlining a little bit and focusing on an advisory body for the finance and what needs to be sent to sponsorship, how can we generate a little bit of pilots. Uh, so it all kind of came about from uh, Snowden, as everything in life, it always <coughs> starts with Edward Snowden. Uh, we were at the Open Rights Group conference on the 5th of June in London in a completely unrelated way, and it was a day after Snowden revelations hit the press. And we all found that ourselves staring at each other in a fairly incomprehensible manner trying to understand what has just happened. And I was sitting with John Perry Barlow, who was the only American guest at the Open Rights Group conference. And as much as he probably is perceived as a good American, I think he wished he wasn't there. Because it wasn't a good day to be American in London. And we all realized that actually a lot of the problems that we have is because there is very fundamental difference between American sense of privacy and European sense of privacy. Uh, and digging into the story, we realize that actually Americans have no law about personal privacy. As a, it's the only is consumer law, but it isn't a human right. Personal privacy, it isn't human right in America. It just isn't. There is only very, very weak legislation initiated by John Kennedy, of all people, in 1968, which is giving consumers sort of slight protection against the people who send them catalogs about cattles and toasters. And that's about that, because the lobbying, as we discovered, the lobby power of catalog companies in America is so immense that any time anybody came up with the need for the personal data protection and tried to make the legislation, the catalogs lobbied it out of existence. 
And in fact, the consumer protection rights in U US have been watered down to practically nothing. So the level of expectation of Americans is zero. So if something goes wrong, for example, if you get a letter from your insurance and it says on it, Mike Smith, daughter killed in a car crash, and you start wondering why they know about things like that, or why they write you about things like that, there's very little recourse as an individual that you can take. And then we look at the situation in Europe, which is very different, because Europe has fundamental difference of experiences with Holocaust and with very recent communism, uh, where we have a very good sense of human rights and personal privacy. You know, these things go together. We have quite thorough legislation, which is at the moment being watered down by American lobby. And I'm totally pro startups. I came from startups, I came from innovation. But the difference in perception between American sense of personal data and European sense of personal data is now being played out very strongly with very, very big tensions through the safe harbor legislation and through all the conversations in EU. We are fundamentally different. But where we started sitting up and taking a bit more notice is when the European technical industry has started being wiped out and its internet hosting is almost non-existent because the scale of the funding in America is unmatchable by anything we can raise here. So we ended up with a situation where, as in 1994, we were hosting everything ourselves under the desks. So I ran Siberia, uh, which was a big hosting provider for all the artists and whoever wanted to do anything. We had our own hosting, there was backspace, there was also fantastic spaces. We were totally in control over hosting and also over the cybersecurity. But since then, slowly, slowly, it has been eroded and there's practically nothing left in Europe of internet hosting companies. We have lost it. It's all gone to Americans. So as much as we are pro-innovation, it's an innovation which is depriving us from control over our own rights. So we started drafting this uh, Bill of Rights and then I bumped into Tim Berners-Lee who started after Snowden thinking about you know, what it is, what he's done with this client server architecture, and it's all his fault, by the way, uh, and he felt a bit bad about it. So he's got this campaign for digital Magna Carta, trying to kind of put a bit of legislation around a bad architecture. So slowly, slowly, he started getting feedback from various people that, yes, digital Magna Carta is needed, exactly because we have such big differences between the human rights online in America, in Europe, and don't even start me about Asia, because there's no rights at all whatsoever. If you are an Asian user of, ele of electronic devices, you, are, you have no recourse at all. And in fact, they have no expectations of that, because they never had expectations <coughs> of privacy. So when we were following the amazing story about Samsung TV listening up on you, uh, some of people who we know quite well were very surprised. Because nobody complained in Asia. Well, no, nobody complained in Asia because they don't think they can. There's nobody to complain to. There, is, there are no rights and no expectations. But because they manufacture a lot of devices that we use, their sense of privacy, or lack of it, is quite fundamental. So we're sort of surrounded by Asian manufacturers on one end, American providers on the other end, completely different sense of expectation of privacy, and Europeans in the middle thinking, uh, what the fuck has just happened? <laughs> and it happened really quickly, really, really quickly. We ran, my husband ran an internet company which had quite a lot of business in Europe and everything has been wiped out, everything has been moved. We managed to get out of it in one in the last minute, but there is almost nothing left, which means we have no control over our data because we don't host it. It's as simple as that. So Tim started putting together the Digital Magna Carta, which is supported now by his foundation, Web We Want Foundation. Uh, he runs festivals in um, South Bank once a year to raise awareness. And on that festival, we got together and started looking at, can we do Digital Magna Carta specifically for UK? Because UK version has to be slightly different than American version and very different than Asian version, if it ever happens. So the inspiration for us was the Digital Magna Carta, but also uh, Marco Civil bill from Brazil. You know, Brazilians don't particularly like Americans, for good reasons. So they were kind of first out of the 
race with something which is legal structure to provide people who are interested in uh, digital rights, and they managed to get it done about a year ago. I happened to be in Cuba at that time, and I couldn't believe how big event that was. That was on every Latin American TV, everywhere. Really, really big deal. And then I came back here and said, what, what, where, what? Nobody knew. Because BBC didn't think that was important enough. Also, BBC, until very recently, did not choose to cover Snowden. So that communication has been quite tightly controlled until very, very recently. So the, I think Bill is going to talk tomorrow about decentralizing of news about time. Because we could see that the channels of communication were very tightly controlled in a way that we probably wouldn't have expected them being so. So when you look at the kind of Bill of Rights, we just sort of sat together with various groups, open right groups, and anybody we could think about to see what matters, what are the priorities, what would we like to see in a legislation to support the innovation going the right way, to support the innovation that can bring us to more control. And we came up with about eight. I mean, there's like millions of rights people want to put, but about eight of them, and you have them hopefully in your hand. Uh, and we consulted on a number of different um, festivals and events, and two priorities seems to come out really strong. <coughs> my data is my data. That you hear everywhere. And when anybody tells you that people <coughs> accept data being gathered by third parties, people accept it in a resigned way, but they don't accept it. They hope somebody will fix it. So somebody who will fix it is you, because there is nobody else fixing it. But there is definitely, both in UK and in US, Annenberg Foundation run a big survey which showed that over 80% of normal Americans don't like any of it and they don't accept it, but they're resigned to it because they can't see any other way of doing it. So that was quite interesting. That's the, the kind of myth that, oh, you know, consumers are fine, they don't care. They do care. They do care, but they have no options. So we went through the long list of things that we care about and that need the control needs to go back to the consumer. And the data, my data is my data, was very strong. Tim Berners-Lee has actually put the program out, which I think Max is involved in quite a lot of people about personal data storage. So how to give people control and how to get these products out. Because you know we can talk until cows come home, but prototype is worth 1,000 words and 1,000 meetings. So that's why we're here because every of these rights needs to have exemplification in the product. You know, rights are great to talk about, to create vocabulary, to address the issues, but ultimately we need products. Without products, nothing will happen. So we took the list of rights after consultation, so the, my data is my data was the most important, but reform of copyrights was quite big one. People understand why we have issues and why we have so little employment in creative industries here because the copyrights are being held tighter and tighter and tighter by Hollywood. People get it. You know, it's quite impressive that people who are not in the industry, they totally get it. The centralization was big because people don't understand the client server architecture, but they understand that there's only three big tech companies owning everybody. And they feel it's wrong. They don't know how, they don't know what, they know it's wrong. So when you actually go through all the lists, we got really big buyout, even on things which are a little bit techy and you wouldn't necessarily expect little old ladies to know. But you know, they know. They have a, people have a very good feeling about when it's wrong and when your personal property is being taken away. The very big, very big topic is also creative digital skills. So we got a lot of feedback on people saying, oh, my job in admin services is going to be automated. Uh, yes. So how can we get over that? How can we get the skill, digital skills to people to actually get work with it? Big drama, big questions. Universities are not coping, nobody's coping. So at that point, we got back to Tom Watson, who just managed to get himself elected as deputy leader of Labour Party. And he's very supportive of further education, digital education, and giving people creative skills. And on the back of it, there came a conversation about funding and about kind of putting a little pocket of something to encourage decentralized product. Because I think everybody agrees that these rights need to be manifested in products, in services. <laughs> so we can say, you know, if you want to change personal data use and personal data tracking, we have to have options how to do differently. We have to present this is how you go about it. Because otherwise, it will be only a talk. 
and we have we know where that comes from. So if we take to, a little bit of today to walk through our proposal for the rights and looking at which product you know or you work on or know somebody who works on something that fits, we can maybe draw by the end of the day a list of priorities where the little bit of pockets of funding and advisory and a bit of a push can be done to get them out of the door. So at least we have a cure. Uh, and I think already from the pitches today, we heard quite a lot of fantastic stuff. But I think we need to be really focused on what actually will work and what can work in, within the next sort of 18 months to two years. Because if you have a product which takes longer than that, very hard to get people to pay attention. So we're looking for prototypes that are demonstrable within probably 18 months, uh, something that you can envisage having a path to deployment within reasonable future and our lifetimes, as opposed to at some point in the far futures. So kind of near futures is, I think, where we are. Uh, and our time scale specifically uh, with the House of Commons is that hopefully we will get the uh, motion tabled for spring. So if we consult now, we'll get all the organizations together who are backing it and a whole bunch of products to show, then between that, it will get through. We have very good support from Tom Watson, but also from a number of other MPs across, it's a kind of cross-party thing, because I think everybody realizes it's needed. And the difficulty, obviously, is the surveillance. We have put it there, but we put it as reform of surveillance, not just stopping surveillance, because as we discovered, GCHQ is really a branch of NSA, and we have to accept it. Unless we change things politically, it will always be so. So, unfortunately, we are seen by the, our European counterparts as part, part of the bad dudes. So when we go and do work in Holland or Athens or Germany, they look at us as the perpetrators because we are the people who are doing the surveillance. We are the UK is seen as a problem, not as a solution. So we have to reform the process inside first. And at the moment it's going the wrong way, because if you look at the recent appointments in surveillance oversight, Cameron does the appointment personally, it's a personal appointment, it's actually quite unbelievable. It's a personal PM appointment, and he picks judges, last two he picked a couple of weeks ago, they are 70 and 71. 70 and 71 year olds. That's about average of the surveillance committee age, 70. What on earth? is going on. How can anybody, the brightest person, can understand and get their head around such complex issue like surveillance and ethics if you are 71? As much as I would like to be supportive of that, I can't because I've seen them. They are not able to comprehend the depth, the nuances, the granularities of what we are up against. So, at some point, that process has to be changed because the Surveillance Oversight Committee is the committee. They are the people who make the decisions. They are the people who decide one by one who is in, who is out, who, is, who will get the warrant, who won't, what level of procurement we're doing. It's a very small group of people. And very recently, we have Jack Straw on it, who was caught uh, being offered directorships on other weapon companies and he is on the surveillance committee. And a number of people who were compromised, not once, not twice, many times, they are still on the surveillance committee. So the reform of that will have to be the first step. And that's why we went for the government, that's why we're working with the political parties, because it has to be done for the political parties. It's not a techie job. But everything else on that list is very much the tech industry, because we can show prototypes. And once we show them, the process of getting that implemented is not that hard. <coughs> so if you can have a quick look at it, uh, could I have a show of hands who is working or who has got a project on the first one, on the uh, personal data ownership? Rax, yes, I could see that. So, okay, so I'll pick, pick up with you later. Uh, any projects on surveillance, on uh, monitoring or giving people more right to know what's being held on them? Yep. Okay, what about the decentralized business environments? Right, one, two. Okay, great. Yes, I've heard your pictures, so that's good. Uh, okay, and then the. Sorry. 
Okay, this next one is complicated, but we spoke to quite a lot of people about it. So to ensure the access, it's basically net neutrality. Uh, it's not something that we can necessarily fight in terms of the technical level, but it does involve prototyping solutions that will support uh, equal access to everything. So if anybody is from the networking industry, come and get me after. Cybersecurity, anybody working with the cybersecurity solutions? No, that's a big area with a big gap. There's about 40,000 places, employment places, for people with cybersecurity skills in UK. 40,000. And the government is not training anybody. If you know anybody who's interested in the topic, get them to talk to us. Um, free and open software. Can I make a comment on that one? Yeah, sure. It feels like it's missing something because um, what's more important is free and open protocols. And the software comes next, but what you want is protocols. So I just like my own software if I don't like yours. Um, yes, okay. HTTP and things like that, they're what they do. Yes, yeah, I agree. So, okay, we can pick up in the phrasing of it. Um, yes, there's a big community which is working on that, but I think the priorities need to be flushed out. Uh, copyright, open access to culture. I know Ed has a couple of projects on that, but anybody else is involved in open access? One. And the digital education, in terms of allowing people to get skilled up. You run, two, three, four. Okay, that's quite a few, brilliant. Great, so we will put together working groups for those products and try to push on with getting some roadmaps on your product and seeing if we can help out with getting them out of the door a bit earlier or at least start talking about it so we can put them as best practice. Because every time we go to the parliament, every time we present it, it's like, show me the best practice, show me the application, show me who's using, give me a referral. And we say, oh, yeah, well, we know about some projects, but nothing is really on the ground, nothing is really quite implemented yet. And there's a very big difference. There's a moment of magic when you run a product and it works, and it backs up your right. So we, we need to get to that point. This, this discussion today is about products. Uh, okay, and just to close it off, uh, we've got a number of different collaborations going on at the moment. South Bank is one of the areas which is very supportive of uh, Digital Bill of Rights UK. And if anybody wants to run sessions on their products and looking for pilots, looking for people to test their products, uh, we've got access to venues there and we can help you to run and test, provide experimental subjects uh, and some bodies to help out. And uh, Web We Run Foundation runs uh, a number of funding, calls for funding. Uh, they not, don't have a huge amount of money, but they are very much in that space. So again, if you have a product that needs funding right now, uh, we can have a look and help you out to put a call for funding through the foundation. We just got approached by Knights, uh, Knights Foundation in the US. Normally they don't fund anybody outside of the US, but they're interested in this area. So hopefully between them and a few friendly uh, private equity companies, we can put something together. Private equity is kind of interested in it because obviously they got blamed by everybody for centralization in the first place. Centralization has occurred as a result of very, very narrow approach of private equity. But there are some people who are beginning to see further than the end of their noses on centralization versus decentralization. And the centralization business models are beginning to percolate, and there is a group of people interested. So I think it's just a matter of keeping the temperature up, talking about it a lot, and showing the products. So we will here for the rest of the day. We will put those uh, uh, bills of rights on the side of the wall. If you can come and put your post-it on the ones that you think you can work on or you're particularly interested in, let me know and we'll write it up after and feed it into the parliament consultation. Thank you very much. Question? Yeah. Um, what's your view on the business models that are going to drive the adoption of these technologies? Right. I think they will come from a couple of different areas. One is, you know, our current architecture is centralized. So even the government has decided to join everything with everything and not actually realize that it will end up with the ID by the back door. Because if you put everybody in one central database, everybody will have an ID by the back door. But that's the most efficient way to do it. 
So I think we have to challenge the notion of efficiency and look where we can take away the efficiencies from the centralization, because it has to be cheaper. So the challenge for us is to really look at how, where are the overheads in centralization that are still not addressed, and can we interpret them better in the decentralized models? It's, it sounds a bit abstract, but like everything, it's got to be, it's competition against centralization. So like everything, you have to just really go into detail and see case by case, sector by sector, product by product, where there are weak points, where you can hit, where we can take a little bit of margin somewhere where centralization does not provide it. So your, your technology suite is really a suite of civil technologies, if you like, that you're looking for the government to adopt as opposed to centralized surveillance type yes. software companies in the US. Yes, and build it up from Europe up because we have slight issues at the moment with the funding of decentralized models from America. So it's most likely to be funding community from UK. A, because it's a business opportunity for them, because they're not getting anything from the American. You know, they're too late. The money is too big. They're always after everybody. Yeah. So, you know, they're not exactly happy. So they can't compete with the centralized funding. They're looking, maybe we can compete with decentralized if we earn enough. So there might be enough reasons for people to get involved. But I think it's sector by sector, which is why it's great to see specific product. Because you, you will hit on something sooner or later, you just have to start looking. Do you think Bitcoin might be the answer? Just a final quick question. Uh, yes, blockchain, yeah. <laughs> so we're just wondering. Um, this, this is more of a, a comment than a question. Is that one block that I always feel is missing in the commercial space is actually the right to be deleted simply which is that, for example, on LinkedIn, and even including third sector, oh, I want to be deleted from this, and I want all my data, my previous orders, my name and address to go, that's very often a complicated and non-standard process. What I'd like to see, although it's very optimistic, is that that process become a lot more standardized, and it becomes somewhat enforceable, for example, I've asked someone in the past week who's actually third sector, they're non-profit, please get rid of me. And then a week after I receive an email from them, so I'm still on the database. That wasn't Ashley Money song, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's it's caused a problem because eight people don't delete because they don't know how to. I'm on the advisory board for the charity cybersecurity because charities are very sensitive, they have no money. So their cybersecurity is terrible. Nine out of ten is terrible. So when they ask to delete people, half of them don't even know what it means. Exactly. Never mind actually doing that. So okay, great. I'll be here for the next Thank you. You can be here. Thank you very much. Round of applause.